Why don't you give me a sign? This is Corinna Jane. That leaves a trail along that shore. It's not your problem, it's mine. With her brand new single, Give Me a Sign. As featured on BBC Introducing. It's just the way it's gotta be. Corinna Jane, give me a sign. Out now. Hello, I'm Sophia Jessica, and welcome to the Fan Carpet. Hello. Hello, I'm Jane. Hi. I'm Mark. Hi, Mark. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, fine, thank you. Good. Hey, Karen. Hiya. Hi, Karen. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, can hear you fine. Yeah, I'll just jump straight in. So it's wonderful to speak to you both today. Um, how's everything going uh, for you? Yeah, good. We're, we're the edit's going well, isn't it, Jane? Um, yes, it is. See my post-its, and uh, that's the film on the board at the back there. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, so if we go back to the beginning, was there a defining moment for you both to get into the in entertainment industry? Um, well, I used to be an actor um, and that's all I wanted to do um, ever since school, really. I went to drama school, um, determined what to go to university, was desperately going to drama school. And I was an actor for a few years and I think um, I kind of just fell out of love with being an actor. I found it very competitive and the rejection quite intense. Um, I think there's, it's, it's a hard industry. So in between acting jobs, I was working in the city, um, just coordinating sort of large corporate events. And some friends of mine asked me to come and help them with a short film. So I sort of joined the team, not really knowing what a producer did, but ended up producing this short film. And I think then I realized that I could be in the industry still be creative but actually have more of a control over where my career was going and actually instigate projects rather than always be trying to climb up the ladder and be in them <laughs> so I suppose if you want a defining moment it was probably that awesome have you yeah Jane? yeah um I've always been um performing and write, writing and directing since I was a kid really you know always sort of involved with it so I never really um I, yeah, I can't really remember life before storytelling. Um, but how I got into film, the defining moment was when I directed my first short film, um, which I had written and I wasn't supposed to direct. Um, so that was like a, the turning point when I fell in love with uh, film directing because I'd only been directing theatre prior to that. Okay. Did you find it um, a big transition when moving from theatre to, to screen? Um, it was a bit of a slow process, actually, because my first experience, um, like Karen, I was acting as well, so I had done sort of acting in front of the camera, but I was also, um, I used to be a professional dancer and a choreographer, so I was doing choreography for films and music videos and different things, so I was used to working with cinematographers and directors and, um, you know, behind, behind the scenes, um, so yeah, so no, it didn't feel that much of a big jump actually because it had been sort of like a slow progression okay awesome um so what was about um love without walls that made you want to be a part of it obviously you wrote on you wrote and directed it but what was the spark to to create the film Sorry, from, from my point of view. Mm. Yeah. Oh, right. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, um, I wrote the first draft in 2011 um, and I had been working in a running a photography workshop in a hostel for um, mm. people that were homeless. Um, and I decided to write this particular story based on uh, my sort of own experiences of working with people that have lost their homes, but also taking um, my own personal accounts of when I was in my teens, when we lost our family home. Um, and then we, I spent time sort of living at other family members' houses. And then I spent sev several years of sleeping on a sofa. Um, so yeah, so that was, so, it's been 
quite a big um this whole sort of subject of homelessness and what is a home has sort of followed me around really and most recently um, in my last home that was um compulsory purchased by the government so again i was sort of like forced out of that house and literally it got bulldozed down so yeah it's, it's an accumulation of all those things that have been put together into this project but i put it aside and didn't really do anything with it and then last year um, Karen and I were due to be making a um, period drama, which didn't go ahead because of COVID. Um, so I got this script back out and realised actually it was just as relevant today as it was back in 2011. Um, and then sent it to Karen and yeah, and here we are now in post-production. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. And what about you, Karen? Um, well, I think, as Jane was saying, we were both in pre-production for another film, which we had to pull because of COVID and um, various other reasons. And I think we were sitting in my garden, weren't we? And you said, oh, I've got this other script. Um, well, you know, I have wrote it ages ago. I don't know what you think. I thought, and I think we should, we should do, put music to it. And I read it and it was just absolutely brilliant. I mean, Jane's got a really unique voice. A really, it's a really strong writing and the story was amazing. It's beautiful, it's funny, it's sad, it's everything. And then add, add music to that. It was like, wow, this is, a, this is an absolute brilliant story and we've got a really unique way of telling it. And I just felt so passionate about the subject matter, about working with Jane, and it was just a great collaboration from the start. Awesome. Um, now, independent filmmaking comes with a lot of challenges. Can you tell me about some of the challenges that you faced? Um, how long have you got? Uh. <laughs> Um, oh, so many challenges. I think trying to make a film during COVID as well was very, very challenging. Obviously, it's a low budget film. It's an independent film. So mm -hmm. much of a problem. Um, but I do think in any film, you're never going to have enough money. Uh, you always need more. You always want to, you know, want to do different things. Um, so that was a challenge. But we worked around the challenges. We set a lot of the locations. They, a lot of them doubled up for other places. So we were very clever where we set the film. There were lots of different locations, but we were very aware that we had to we couldn't do big unit moves so they had to be all close to each other so we were quite clever in how we engineered that um crew at the time it's, it was really really difficult to to get people on board because the, the industry at that point went crazy everybody was suddenly in demand for work so we were lucky to get the crew that we got we you know we really fought for them and they were brilliant um, just lots of other little problems. Like, I mean, my dog was in it, for, for example. Um, she's not a trained film or TV dog. And we thought, yeah, what, what could possibly go wrong? And it was a great day. And I'm saying that with a big smile. Um, but she was a pain in the ass, to be honest. And um, there was a lot of problems. And I, I couldn't, she wouldn't listen to a word I said. And I was on set trying to be in charge of the cast and crew, not being able to control my own dog. So that was an interesting day. We also used my old car, my 2CV, as a, as a character in the film. And I think, I think it was a day before we started shooting, I went to start the car to drive it down to the location and he wouldn't start. So there was this big panic of, oh my God, we've got all these scenes <laughs> the next few days with this car, what are we going to do? Uh, and I, I thank my dad, um, if he's listening to this, for solving that problem and, and getting the, the squirty WD-40 spray out. The irony is that the car is you know it's supposed to not start in the in the film <laughs> but obviously we needed to get him to set he's called patrick <laughs> he has a name it's, it's... <laughs> awesome um and do you have any memories jane from working on the film oh i have lots of memories from working on the film no especially i mean at the moment because i'm in the edit um I'm, you know, it's it's all coming flooding back, which is lovely. And I have really good memories, which is lovely. Um, yeah, just everything about it, really. I mean, obviously, it being such a personal project, but working with Karen, working with the cast and the crew. And yeah, and just the fact that I sort of, I sit here watching all the rushes thinking, oh my God, I can't believe we pulled this off. Because I think when we talk about independent film, there's a you know, there's lots of different types of independent film, isn't there? Like, I think this is a real proper independent film. I mean, mm. I think independent films are still called independent films even when they're funded by some of the big bodies. So I think, you know, there are different... This is, yeah, grassroots indie, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think if you've got a good... Well, I hope we've got a good story and we've got, you know, and you've got the talent. Um, not, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about everybody, of course. Um, mm. You know... 
that's that's what that's what matters and that's what's important i think absolutely um you've assembled a wonderful cast uh, for this uh, what were they like to work with Oh, they were brilliant. Um, obviously, the two leads were fantastic throughout. They were in every day. So it, was, it felt like a family with the cast and the crew. But the, the people that came in, the other characters were oh, incredible, weren't they? I mean, we had a yeah. great casting director that pulled all that together for us. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, you know, working the likes of Paul Barber and Sheila Reed, they were, they were brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Mm -hmm. So much fun to work with. Yeah. So it's such a big cast, mm. a really big cast. And we, we always laugh because, you know, I always thought this was a two-hander and actually there are, it's actually quite, quite a cast and of all ages. I think our youngest is two mm -hmm. and I'm going right up to whatever age. <laughs> cool. Um, so what, what's the collaboration like um, between you two? I think it's great. <laughs> I don't know what Karen thinks. It's wonderful. No, it's like my dream. It's been my dream to uh, work with a producer in this capacity in this way. Oh, we we worked together for I think it was quite intense, wasn't it? So mm. I think we got we became quite close in the like I think four or five months up to the start date we were um you know I actually I, I miss talking to Jane every day we'd have like three or four phone calls a day starting from like seven o'clock in the morning right through um and it, it was brilliant and I think when we finished shooting we both felt I definitely suffered from post-film blues it was quite depressing <laughs> because it just suddenly ended and everybody went about you know on to their next job and we were going oh well that's it then oh my god and I know the work there's still so much work to be done we've got to get through post-production and you know get the film released but it's it's different. It feels different. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, what is your preferred genre? Do you have have any favourite films? Ooh, well, I I actually like horror films, um, and I haven't actually I haven't actually read. I'm going to say this. I haven't actually read a script that I want to produce yet in in the horror genre. But I do love um, horror films. I wouldn't at some point like to do one. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I like all sorts actually. I've got quite a varied taste, which I think is interesting. I think I've been asked before, oh, what defines you as a producer? What films do you make? And I'm like, I just want to make films I like to watch, mm. which I, think I probably need to work on that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I like all sorts. I mean, Love Without Walls is a music drama and it's, it's brilliant. And since we made the film, I've been, you know, I've been searching for music dramas because I just think it, it's brilliant when you've got a film with such strong music. Mm. Absolutely. And for you, Jane? Yeah, I mean, I, I've got f favourite films and favourite films that, uh, and films that have influenced me. I think it sort of has changed with age. Um, I think, and I think the, the first film that I remember going to the cinema to see was Watcher, The Watcher in the Woods, I think with Betty Davis. And it's, it's supposed to be a kid's Disney film, but it absolutely scared the crap out of me. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do like horror. I love musicals. Um, I love drama. Um, I say one of my favourite films, or one of the films that sometimes it's not. It's you know, it's about how a film makes you feel, isn't it? You remember how it makes you feel. And Dancer in the Dark was a film that I will never forget watching. Um, the effect it had on me, I just can't can't tell you. Um, and the same with Greece. Obviously, slightly different to Dancer in the Dark, but I remember when I watched Greece, I went out into the street and um, got all the local kids, reenacted the whole film and then had my hair cut short like Danny Zuko so that I could play him. Um, so yeah, and, and Dirty Dancing, you know, all, all the, old, the old classics. Um, and 21 Grams, that was a film that um, made me want to make films actually. And um, I do like a bit of Ken Loach, I have to say. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so are there any other aspects of the entertainment industry that you'd like to pursue? Um, hmm, interesting. Um, well, I, I can't sing, so that's out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although I tried. Um, and I think, I think acting, I think I've put that to bed really for quite a for quite a while, I was like, "Oh, I'll, I'll still, I'll still keep my acting profile. I'll still, you know, I'll still dabble." But I think, I think I've kind of decided that that's not really for me. Um, to be honest, I think I just want to continue producing uh, and producing really good stuff. I've, 
you know, lots of people say, oh, do you want to direct? And I'm, I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not that producer that wants to do everything. I, I literally want to create wonderful stories and work with great people and carry on producing them. Oh. Yeah, I just want to direct. Um, I'm, I will write and I'm writing other stuff, but I would only ever, I think, ever write stuff for myself. I can never work as a job in act, um, writer or a writer on spec who, you know, is given the subject and then off they go and write. I don't know how they do that. Um, but I tell you what I would love to do. I'd love to do a project, maybe like a musical that combines actually my sort of choreography skills and my directing. Um, that would be really cool. Awesome. Um, do you have any projects that you're waiting to get back to? Um, we've got one in the in development that we were supposed to shoot last year, which um, the writer's now done a new version of the script. So we've got that to look at. And I've been sent um, a few scripts that I, I need to read. And a few a, or a few hundred? A few. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a few hundred because I haven't read any of them yet. Um, and there's a couple of books I'm interested in optioning, but we'll, we'll see. Because I would quite like to do te television as well. Yeah, I'd like to do television. I'd really love to do a series like a, something like The Sopranos. I mean, who wouldn't? Um, some sort of crime thriller type of thing. Um, and yeah, I'll be, I'll, hopefully we can get Witch West up and running again. That would be absolutely amazing. And um, yeah, and I, I yeah, would love to do a musical. You know, obviously this is a music drama, but an all singing, all dancing musical. Musical horror, maybe. Oh. Awesome. Um, who inspires you in the industry? Um, <laughs> for, for, for me, I would say, yeah, I mean, I think Ken Loach, really, because... Well, for loads of reasons. I mean, how many films he's made, his integrity, um, and just, yeah, I've been following his career for many a year. And Rebecca O'Brien, his producer, and Paul Abbotty, the writer, I think as a trio, they work brilliantly together. Um, I think I remember being at the Berlin Film Festival for the very first time with my first feature film and stumbling across a book in this book market by Christine Vachon, um, her company Killer Films that she runs from, I think it's New York or Los Angeles. And her story of how she built the company from nothing right through to this successful um, production company. And so I've, I've kind of followed her career and followed what she's done. And I think she's very inspiring. And I've, I, I aspire to be that, that producer, that producer with all of those different genres, different projects of varying different, um, you know, different budget levels mm. and everything. She's quite amazing. Awesome. Um, do you have a wish list of who you'd like to work with? Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. um, when we do this Sopranos type of thing, I'm thinking it to be set in Spain, and I'm thinking of Javier Bardem, um, Antonio Banderas, Luis Sanchez, um, and Penelope Cruz. Um, just yeah, an array of Spanish-speaking wonderful actors. I'm going to be totally shot down for saying this, and I know I know the people that are going to be listening to this who will be reading me going, "What did you say that for?" <laughs> but I would really like to make a film with Pierce Brosnan. I think um, <laughs> I, mean, having, I, I grew up with Golden Eye. He was he was my Bond. Um, again, I'm going to get phone calls from this moment onwards. But I again, I've, it's, he's an actor that I think he can still greenlight a film, and I, I think it'd be good fun to work with him. He sounds like a good, good um, guy. He's a wonderful actor. Mm. Yeah, he's not a great singer. If you've seen Mamma Mia, you do sort of. Yeah, I've seen Mamma Mia. <laughs> How's his Spanish? I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure he's fluent, Jane. I'm sure he's fluent. <laughs> So, um, with the popularity of streaming services like Netflix, uh, what do you think the future of cinema is? Oh gosh, um, if you'd asked me this a few months ago, I really did <clears> think <throat> it was dying of death. Um, I think it's coming back because I think people want to go and see a film on a big screen, um, and I think the it, we we've missed it. We've missed it so much, and I think Netflix and Amazon and all those other platforms have served a great purpose. They do serve a great purpose. 
they're brilliant. The amount of um, content that we can we can just binge, and I think our, how we consume content has changed. But nothing beats that experience of going to the cinema with your popcorn, sitting down, the big screen, all the surround sound, and seeing something in that. I mean, I've watched films in the cinema, and then I've seen them again on Netflix, and I thought, oh god, it's awful film. But in the cinema, everything felt so different. It was the whole atmosphere. And, and when your phone you off. Yeah, with the phone off. And you haven't got your husband going, can you just pause it a minute while I go for a wee? <laughs> you, can't, you, can't get, you can't get that same experience, I think, um, sitting in front of <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But you, Jane? Yeah, I know exactly what Karen said, but yeah, I mean, it's that. I think when I'm watching a film at home, it's like there's too many distractions. Um, and I really hate it if you've recommended a film to someone and you're sat there watching it with them and you're like, and then you see them like look away for a minute and you're thinking, don't look away, like this is the best bit. Or, you know, there's a knock at the door or the dog barks or something. There's all these distractions. Like Karen said, I think there's nothing like being in the cinema with the phones off and just like being immersed. Even mm -hmm. just going on your own. I went last week to the cinema on my own at 10.30 in the morning to see another round and I tell you what it was just amazing I mean there was only three people in the cinema unfortunately but um yeah I just just loved it just two hours of just no distractions wonderful Matt Mickelson's another another amazing actor <sighs> yeah that film something so what are you hoping audience will take away from Love Without Wars when they get a chance to see it obviously it's in post at the moment so it's going to be a little while. Um, I think it, it's a film that it does carry a message. It does carry. It does address an important subject matter. But we've not we've not laboured that. It's it's beautiful. Um, it's funny in places. It makes you laugh. It makes you cry. Um, I'm, I can't reveal the ending. I nearly did in one interview. Um, I think Jane was um, trying to text me, going, "What are you doing? What are you doing? Are you giving away the ending?" Um, but it, it, it's it's hopeful and it's it's poignant. It makes you think, and it's a journey. These two characters go on on this incredible journey, and you go on it with them. So I think it's a bit of escapism, um, but it also makes you think. Yeah. Thanks, cool. Um, and ju just finally, um, where can we find you online to keep up with everything you're doing? Um, we've got a website for the film, which is lovewithoutwallsfilm.com. Um, there's my uh, production company, hiddendoorproductions.co.uk. Jane, Jane, you've got a website too. I have, it's, yeah, um, janegold.com. <laughs> <laughs> but we're also on Facebook um, individually and the film's on Facebook and Twitter and we just type in Love Without Walls and it, it pops up. Awesome. Uh, do you have a, a release date in mind for the film? Or is it too early to tell? We're, we're hoping that we'll have the film finished, completely finished by November. And the release will probably be next year because we want it to be a 2022 film. So it starts the film year from the very beginning. Right. Sounds good. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me this this evening, this afternoon. Uh, it's been wonderful to speak to you. Um, good luck thank with you. the film. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank Good you. luck with the film. Thanks very much. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for watching The Fan Carpet. Please follow us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more content next time. on the largest of the Balearic Islands, Mallorca. With the turquoise waters of the Mediterranean Sea, beautiful mountainous landscape, the thriving city of Palma, quaint little market towns, a growing number of luxury hotels, it's no surprise that the likes of Audrey Hepburn and Elizabeth Taylor like to holiday here. So come and join me as I take you round Mallorca.
Thank you for watching the fan carpet. If you like this video, be sure to click that thumbs up button at the bottom of your screen. And also be sure to subscribe to the fan carpet YouTube channels. They're absolutely free. That's so much fun too. Be sure to check out the official website, thefancarpet.com. Also, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to stay up to date with reviews, competitions, the latest news, and so much more.